Most people see the lilac. They don't see the beautiful lines and the white and the yellow that is running down the center of there. And that's why when you put the yellow next to it, like so, can you see yeah. how much that yellow is really highlighted and brought out on the actual iris? I'm not good with orchids, but I just put it out there. I kill orchids within about four weeks. So you've got frilly knickers, you've got Actea, Black no, Negligee, um, black stockings. Black stockings, the Lictrum. So you hot can lips. Have, yeah, hot Selby yes. hot lips. You know, you can have a really saucy Who border. Hello and welcome to Talking Dirty episode 22 over at East Ruston Old Vicarage. Looking all wrapped up and snug as a bug in a rug on this cool, cool winter day is Alan Edward Herbert Gray. Herbert, our happy and handsome horticulturalist. Thank you very much for the compliment. I'm glad you think that I'm happy. I endeavour to be happy. I'm one of those people whose glass is always half full, which is an advantage, I think, especially so half in this full of what, time. Alan? <laughs> half full of happiness. It's never half empty. It's always half full. Anyway, um, over at near Cambridgeshire, shall we say, uh, we have Thordis, Maria Sophia Friedrichsen, looking wonderful in wine. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, I'll be in a bath of it, to be honest, but it's a bit early. Uh, also, I've gone a little bit festive. My jumper has a dog with a Christmas hat <laughs> on it. I thought... December has arrived, let's embrace it. And uh, talking of embracing people, I wish I could actually physically embrace her. We have Val Iris Bourne back on the podcast, writer, organic gardener, and award winner, Val. Yes, <laughs> yes, I didn't think I'd win, but, but did. I did. <laughs> Tell yes. us about it. This is obviously the Garden Media Guild Award. Well, um, it didn't bode well because when I, the, the, the ceremony was on Thursday and it was a Zoom ceremony for obvious reasons. And um, I, I was working and I ran my computer down on its battery because my grandson, James, who's my computer expert, age 12, <laughs> says, Nanny, you must let the battery run down before you recharge it. So I let it run down to 0.6, 6% or whatever it is. And then I plugged in the cable so that I could watch the thing and the little light never lit up. So I immediately went on to Amazon with my last 6%. Sorry about that, um, people. Uh, and ordered a new cable. But it didn't come until the next day. So I, I didn't actually see it. But then I could check my emails on another computer. And um, I got all these messages at about 8 o'clock in the evening saying, you've won, you've won. But I didn't know what I had won. So. <laughs> and and you... I was up to two. You won, was a journalist, journalist of the year. Of the year. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I've won rather a lot. And I think people are really fed up with it. <laughs> I bet you're not. Andrea Gray, no, I'm not. But Andrea Gray in, it introduced the award with her chickens and everybody comments and there's a sort of strip. And I was completely upstaged by the chickens because everybody <laughs> mentioned the chickens. But never mind. And nobody did now. <laughs> the thing is that I didn't enter for years. And then I thought, crikey, I'm really old. If I don't enter, I'm never going to win. <laughs> and then I started entering about 10 years ago. You got to be in it to win it. And, you know, rightly, deservedly won. Thank you very much. That's really kind of you. <laughs> Even if you were upstairs. Congratulations, Val. Well yeah, congratulations <laughs> all round. I mean, we last caught up with you in rather warmer times when you were surrounded yeah. by dahlias and roses that you'd cut from the garden. Um, though, actually, I mean, dahlias have been going on and on and on this year. Yes, I, cu I cut my last ones at the end of November. That is the first time ever. And for many years, I was a teacher. And I would go off on, you know, have August off and then we get back in September and you come back and you'd be all brown. And by about September the 12th, there'd be frosts, yes. you know, in the sort of heart of England. And then the dahlias would blacken. But now the climate's changed so much that they go on and on and on. And they're just wonderful things. And I mustn't go on about them anymore. <laughs> Well, I, th I think you should, because when you go on and on and on, you just sound like a Tory MP. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how wrong that is. <laughs> I'm not going to get into politics, but <laughs> I, was, I was born under the gas tower at Southall. I'm not going to be a Tory MP, Alan. 
I'm very proud of it. <laughs> Do you know, it's interesting, the, um, the, the season going on and on, my, because I live in sort of, there's a lot of houses and they're all emanating heat. There's a lot of like little pockets of warmth. And um, I mean, I really haven't had a huge amount of frost, hardly any of it at all. And my front garden, which is south facing, I've got helichrysums in flower. I've got all these little late sown larkspurs. I mean, just little ones, little diminutive yes. ones. But I walk past, I think this just does not look like November or December. It's crazy. It is absolutely bizarre because I had to uh, pull up a lot of flowering nasturtiums about a week ago because they're messing up the snowdrops that are coming up. <laughs> I wanted those nasturtiums in flower in July. Would oh. they germinate? No. <laughs> it, it is bizarre. And I've got alstroemerias out and, and, and sort of leftover things. I've got a, a sea holly in flower. It's nuts. I, um, I had that with all I grand flora. It absolutely wouldn't grow earlier in the year. But now what? all of a sudden the first all of my year seemed to have been in November. <laughs> I think yeah. that's just one of the things yeah. which we should we should actually do is to embrace the season though, because I mean you know Val, you say that your your dailies have gone on and on longer and longer. Yeah. It is it is over the past thirty or forty years that we've seen our autumn stretch out, um, and it you is. know yeah. at the beginning of September we'd have a frost and everything would change. We'd rip everything out. Yeah, put absolutely, we are gardening in a different way, mm. and I've had to cut down part of my autumn border now. Which yeah. I've never done before because the snowdrops are so early. If I leave it any later, I'm going to be, you know, having to go round with, you know, a pair of scissors because I grow my snowdrops under roses. I grow them in amongst um, uh, uh, perennials, um, underneath clematis, viticella, and it's all having to. A lot of it's having to come down early. Um, because, uh, you know, the, the snowdrops that you're expecting to, would normally have come up in January, 10 years ago even, are now really, you know, shooting up. Well, we've got quite a few in bloom. I expect you have too, because you've yes, got a yes. collection, many more than I've got. But um, I think the great thing is that we, you're absolutely right. We used to tuck them into places underneath other plants that did for the rest of the year, if yes. you like. Um, yes. They would occupy their, their place in the winter and the early part of the spring, and then we'd forget about them, and that, that would be that. Yes. Um, but, you know, with this advent of longer autumns, we, for instance, we've got the most fantastic um, range now of late flowering, garden worthy chrysanthemums. Um, yes, some of them are floppy. But, yeah, but if you <laughs> treat them right, I mean, give them the Chelsea chop. The other thing that you can do with chrysanthemums is you stick a fork underneath them and break the roots, just ease them up a bit and break the roots. That will check their growth as well to stop them yeah, growing that's... too tall. Um, and, you know, um, <laughs> we are in a dilemma because, like you, I've been having to go around the house and chop things away that I didn't really want to chop away um, no. because they're still looking so nice. But you've got to do it. Yes. Yes, I mean, I, I'm just going to get one of my autumn uh, snowdrops out. And this is actually one that um, um, came from uh, Cambridgeshire, Cambridgeshire, Foxton. Do you know Foxton? No, I don't. It is, uh, it's near Cambridge and it's Don Sims Early. And it's, um, it's just, I don't know where to hold it. It's just um, yeah. the most incredible one at bulking up. Rod yeah. Leeds uh, launched it about 2000 and it came from High Down, uh, Frederick Stern's garden down in Worthing, yeah. which I visited and it's an amazing place. It's owned by the local council. It's really worth a visit if you're on the South Coast. And um, this is Don Sims Early. And the wonderful thing about it is it's one of those snowdrops that it, it doesn't get set seed, I don't know whether it's sterile or it just doesn't get um, pollinated, um, but it's one of those that bulks up and it, 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 it's a bit like Godfrey Owen. It bulks up and yes. produces a gap between each bulb. So within about five or six years, you'll have a clump of it. Um, it's a hymalus. You'll have a clump of it about two feet across. And I've given a lot of this away over the years and it's just a very lovely thing. Um, it's quite short, um, and the flowers don't open this widely in the garden. It's just because it's in the warm in here. But it is a lovely thing. So that's one of mine, and that's probably the best one I've got at, at the moment, although a lot of my autumn ones have gone over. It's uh, mine, but I think the, the one that I've got out that's looking lovely at the moment is called Santa Claus. And Santa Claus oh, I haven't is got that one. 
<laughs> oh, it's a little bit early because you know Santa Claus Christmas. I mean, it it is. It's a good month earlier than it should be, but I mean, it's blooming, and it. Well, and you know what happens when we get this frequently asked question: Are my polyanthus are blooming now? Will they bloom again in the spring? Yeah. Well, the answer to that is probably yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, um, but you know, just enjoy it while you can. I mean, enjoy flowers out of season. Yeah, I'm a very much live for the girl, live yeah. for the day girl. I don't ever worry about it that much. I saw a hedgehog um, on Sunday. I took some something back up the village because we're very much shut down here. And um, as I was talking to my neighbour from a safe distance, a hedgehog strode past. And you know, they, they are, that's obviously not hibernating, but in New Zealand where they're introduced and the climate's warmer, hedgehogs don't hibernate at all. No. So I'm, I'm not too worried about seeing a hedgehog. I have a tortoise uh, which we've had for years and the tortoise, it goes in and out of hibernation throughout the winter. I mean, I, you know, I, I know several people that are, that are regular visitors to the garden. They have a secure garden and they just leave their tortoise and it goes and buries itself in cold weather and pops out when it's warm enough. Um, oh. And ours does exactly the same, which is rather lovely in a way. Yes. You must have had it a long time though, very long lived. Yes, they are. I mean, I think mine's about, well, I'm not going to tell you how old it was because I had it when I was a little boy. <laughs> Can't be as old as I am, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, to go back to um, to Galanthus, um, yes. and I, I probably should have introduced you as a Galanthophile as well, Val. I, yes. with a tiny garden, I, I've not even allowed myself. I also don't think I have the budget to allow myself to get into snowdrops. I went to Alan's last snowdrop event and discovered that I am naturally drawn to everything that's over 25 pounds a bulb. So I am, I must not allow myself to get into snowdrops. Uh, but it's, it's really interesting. Um, I kind of feel like somebody should publish a list of the ones that are easier, better doers, good clump formers because if you're just drawn to the flower you might get something that's really miffy I, i've just written actually for the telegraph the, the 10 easier snowdrops yes because the strange thing about snowdrops is it's it's one of life's paradoxes i mean i'm drawn to snowdrops and i'm drawn to expensive snowdrops and i can't say very much because the best beloved is in the kitchen so i, I <laughs> i'm not talking about prices here but the strange thing is that you get these snowdrops um, EA bulbs came out in about 2005, and the very first bulbs were £120. But it's such a successful snowdrop that the second year the price fell to £60. And now if you go to a snowdrop sa sale, people don't even buy it because everybody's got it. I've given it to friends. And, uh, you know, the strong snowdrops, uh, they do come down in price. I can send you my my article. I only promise not to publish it anywhere before it comes out. And um, you know, it is uh, one of these strange things. And but the miffy ones, Seraph. Oh, that's one. Boyd's double. I must be on about my six Boyd's double. I've never managed to keep it for very long. <laughs> but I, I have in my hand a water lily pot because. Um, what I do when I get a new snowdrop, and I've spent quite a lot of money in it, on it, is I used to have a cat and she invariably dug up the very expensive snowdrop, probably because the ground was disturbed, because you shouldn't keep them in pots, even if you spent a lot of money on them, you should get them into the ground because they're much less vulnerable. And I use these water lily pots, you know, they're about 50p to 90p, depending where you go, and then you take out your snowdrop while you got it in the pot, you mix up some compost, some perlite, some coarse grit, you write a label, and then you pop it in here and then you sink this in the ground. And that, that is a very good way of starting, you know, with snowdrops. And um, I, I give quite a lot of snowdrops away, Thordis, so I'll give you one or two that I really rate. Yes, that was easy. You know, <laughs> just touched on something there, Val. One of the things about gardeners is they are generous folk. Um, yes. I have a friend called Brian, and Brian grows all his snowdrops um, in those water lily pots, and he sinks them into the ground, and you know, digs them up in July or whenever it is, and then yes. and divides the bulbs up. And he said, have you got so-and-so? And I said, no, no, I, well, you'd like this one. I said, all right, well, I'll have it. He publishes a list every year, you see, of snowdrops he's selling. Yes. And so <clears throat> he gives me a pot and instead of there being one bulb, there's probably five bulbs. There's probably two flowering and three, you know, coming on in that pot. And I said, yes. you're very generous, Brian. He said, well, they're only bulbs, aren't they? I wish a few is more. This, is this Mr. Ellis? Yes, of course it is. 
<laughs> I thought it might be. Yes, uh, I know people are very generous, and you know yeah. that's the lovely thing about it, because yeah. you know you go around your garden, and and um, my I got into snowdrops when I went to. Uh, Primrose Warburg's garden in 97 yeah. following her death and yeah. I was invited to go to the garden um, um, and a lot of people from Botanic Gardens were there and little old me and um, it was a perfect day and John Grimshaw got everybody to write down what they wanted and I didn't write anything down and then at, right at the end he said to me um, would you like anything I can dig you something up now and he gave me um, Lady Beatrix Stanley, which is excellent, um, at Kinsey I Augustus, he gave me about five and then he gave me one bulb of trim uh, and that's what started me off and that was his generosity. Um, you know, John Grimshaw, who is now up at the Yorkshire yeah. Arboretum, I think it's called, and, and I go around my garden and I've still got the trim and I passed one on to Tim Ingram, uh, probably nearly 20 years ago, because he liked it so much. I used to garden in Hook Norton and it did much better there because it was drier and warmer. And Tim um, took it away and it, Trim is very, very promiscuous. It produced a hybrid, which is now called Copton Trim. And I know that that Copton Trim yeah, comes all the way back to me. Yeah. And it's lovely when it comes up because of course he gave me some back. <laughs> so it's much more than plants, snowdrops. Not only is it promiscuous, trim we're talking about here, by the way. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Trim, look, we have trim pasta. My days of promiscuity are over, I promise you. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> however, however, I mean, trim is a great increaser. Um, and one of the, I don't know whether it's in your in your list or not, but it's one of the snowdrops that I would say to people grow because it enthuses you because it is so um, prolific in a way and it makes lots and lots and lots of babies. I first read a, an article by Roy Lancaster when somebody had actually given him this, this snowdrop, um, which was entirely different from all the others in the fact that yes. it had flared petals a bit like a pagoda roof um, and a little dab of green on the outside and all the rest of it, which looked like a paintbrush had been daubed on it. Um, and that started me off. Oh, I don't grow trim, you see. There are two trims, though. There is one that's very willing to grow and one that isn't willing to grow. I've got the one that's willing now. <laughs> and I've obviously got some one of the recalcitrant ones, but I do know that it is the right trim. But the one of the easiest ones to grow um, for this is Trumps, which is really prolific and it's got a nice marking too, a nice shape and a nice marking. Because quite frankly, um, um, trim crosses and produces so many hybrids that we've got trism, trumpaloo, trim poster, trimmer. We've got so many baby trim. There's too many of them now, but uh, so you have to be a bit careful. And, you know what um, the problem is now, don't you? The problem is that they're all lovely. Yeah, I know. <laughs> You were mentioning something, um, a snowdrop that did very well a little while ago. And I remember you said it was, I think it was EA Bowles. It started off at 120 pounds yes. a bulb, mm -hmm. as did one called Green Tear, which was completely yes, that, on the outside. my friend Gertie and discovered that. Yeah. Um, yes. I bought that at vast expense, I have to say. Yes. But since it's increased so well, I've given lots and lots of it away. Well, about eight. I, I've actually had to stop giving it away because everybody who came to the garden would say, um, oh, that's wonderful. And it's another one that sort of spreads out as it um, yes, spreads yes. itself out. So you can get one up easily. Never dig a clump up that's tight in full flower because you're likely yeah. to lose it. Um, but, you know, you th there are certain ones you can get up fairly easily. And I've given so many away that I, I, ne I was never getting a decent clump. So I said about to myself about two years ago, no, you must stop this. So. It, I'm allowing it to bulk up a bit now, but green yeah. tea is lovely. And that was found in a wood in the Netherlands by Gertie and uh, Van der Kock, who is a very generous yeah. man. And he's really into ferns. So he's given me some lovely ferns over the years. And um, during lockdown, um, I think Gertian has taken pity on me, probably because he thinks I'm terribly elderly. And he phones me up quite regularly and asks me how I am, which is lovely. So I think plants people are lovely. Yes, they are, I think. I agree with you entirely, mm -hmm. yeah. How many snowdrops do you have? Mm, probably 300 different ones. I've been collecting them for, well, since 97, yes. A while. 
Uh, I, I, sort of, I don't think all, sorry. This collect, collecting of plants does creep up on you because we were in, we thought we'd have a snowdrop day here about three or four years ago. And Joe Sharman came along from Monk Silver Nursery and said to me, well, how many snowdrops have you got? And I said, well, I really don't know. I've been, you know, you get the odd one up various places and somebody gives you some and all the rest of it. So we went around, we had a count up and we got to 120 and I was absolutely flabbergasted. Yes, I, I can imagine. Idea. Yes. Um, he said, well, that is enough to, uh, to be of interest to other people. So, yes, like, you know, don't, don't worry about opening your garden. I mean, seek and you shall find. <laughs> really. I, I think it gets worse as you get older, actually, because you suddenly I had one year um, when I broke my arm. Um, I fell out down outside the telegraph offices and I broke it in three paces and I did a really good job on it. And I got into trouble because I came back on the train with it. You know, it was a little bit disastrous. And, you know, I was sitting there with my broken arm, you know, in a lot of pain and, uh, and using my dictation thing to write and things. And I suddenly thought, well, I haven't got that much time left. I think I'll just buy it. I think I'll just have it. Yes. I yes. think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yes. All those years of saying, no, I can't buy that. I thought, no. It'll take five years to do anything. I shall have it. I think you're an enabler, Val. You're like my mum. I must never go shopping with my mum because she always <laughs> she always has advice like that. Well, you don't know how long you've got left. You might as well have it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more true in my case, Thordis. <laughs> so we've had some snowdrop show and tell. What else do you have squirreled away by your screen, Val? Well, I, I'm very, very fond of these winter flowering clematis. And this is actually freckles, um, which I haven't got on a south facing wall. I've got it scrambling over shrubs and over a clematis armandii. And um, they're quite pendant, these bells, so you need to go to look up to them. And this is um, a, a seedling of uh, clematis cirrhosa, and it was discovered or spotted by Raymond Everson in uh, Mallorca. And it's much more heavily spotted than most Balearicas. Uh, and the, the reason I love it is because it's always out in November. It's much earlier than the one uh, other one that I have on the front of the house, which is um, Baliac, a cirrhosa variety Balearica, which is much more subtle. Um, the bells are much greener. There's a little bit of maroon spotting. This is an Alan Gray version <laughs> of um, Clematis cirrhosa. Um, you know, it, it, yes, indeed, indeed it is. And I remember going to a friend of mine, Don and Sally, they invited me to look at their garden. And this was in probably late January, January, early February. And they had this particular clematis scrambling over an arch as you went into through from their front garden into the back garden. And Sally just said to me, look up. And I looked up and I was astonished. It was fabulous. Yes, it is. It's absolutely lovely. And um, I first saw it on the front of a butcher's shop in Hook Norton um, years ago, um, not that many years ago, probably 20 years ago. Mm. I thought, oh, I must grow that. And then, of course, I did grow it, but I had to plant another one here. And um, they're just wonderful, those winter flowering clematis. They're no prune, but they're so good for the early bees or the late bees um, at this time of year. And um, by my gate, um, I've only got the seed heads of this, actually. Um, this is a, from a clematis, an orange peel clematis called Glasnevin Dusk. And, and um, I love the seed heads because they're so silky uh, in the winter. And, it, and I don't prune it. And it has chocolate coloured bells, thick tepals, but they're chocolate. I guess I will send you a picture, Thordis. And uh, it scrambles over blue pleurum fruticosum at the gate, lovely. which has got those lovely sulfur yellow um, heads. And if you don't know this, this is one of the very few shrubby umbellifers um, that you can grow. And I have one uh, down there. It's a bit wind prone. It gets a bit battered now and again. It's a devil to propagate. Um, I have another one in the frame. It always is, and that's probably why it's regarded as, shall I say, an in inverted commas, a smart plant, because you see it in gardens of um, horticulturalists, really, people that know and care about gardens. It's got lovely yeah, it's gorgeous foliage. It can be floppy and an untidy devil, um, so it's probably good yes. that you do actually 
chop it about a bit to, to keep it comely, as they say. Yeah. Um, but it has these wonderful sort of limey heads of a flower that's absolutely beautiful. Yes, I know. And, and in August, you know, when I come through the gate and I see this combination mm. of the chocolate coloured bells of this clematis, which is hard to find, plus an even dusk. Um, I'm trying to get it out there. I've given cuttings to various people. I've um, written it down, Val. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> it is absolutely beautiful. And then you see these wonderful sort of um, um, heads about two inches across and they're that limey green yellow. It's just like having um, a glass of cool lemonade when you come back on a hot day and you've been in the yeah. car. It's one of my very favourite things. I've grown it for years and I, I, it does get, the wind does damage it. So it's by the gate and it sort of gets blown about, but it responds very well to being cut back in late yeah. spring. It will mm. shoot. And so you mentioned clematis good. cuttings. Anyone who is keen to take cuttings, either of their own clematis or if they've seen a smart one in a friend's garden, um, there's a great video which has helped lots of people who've had uh, prior difficulty on, on our Get Gardening YouTube yes. channel. So um, I think it's called Queen of the Claspers. So if you pop that yes. into your YouTube search bar, um, or we'll try and link to it so you can, uh, you can have a go at doing some clematis cuttings yourself. I've passed this on to New Leaf Clematis, who are based um, near Evesham. Uh, in the hopes that, and Val, um, or oh, what's her name? Val Neville Perry, I think it is, who has the Montana collection down in the New Forest. She's got some cuttings as well, so I hope it will go. Um, the winter honeysuckle is already out. And you know, we, um, I grow a lot of scented winter shrubs and it, this is a bit more miserable looking than it was because we had frost last night. And um, my winter suite is absolutely crammed with buds. But we're so cold here that a lot of those flowers get browned by the um, by the uh, weather. So that's the reason I grow so many witch hazels. I think I'm only going to show you um, this nibbled hepatica foliage. <laughs> I, I, I love hepaticas. Oh, I this has really yeah. nice foliage. This came from David Foreman, who gave it gave it to me years ago, and I have got the name, but I I I, I will try and dredge it up. Um, it I love foliage in winter. Uh, I really appreciate all the things that have good leaves in winter. Um, and oh, I you. particularly love a fern called Richard Case, Polypodium cambricum, Richard Case. And I've written about it just recently um, in an article, and um, it was discovered in a Welsh gorge in 1668. <laughs> And the editor emailed me back and said, you must have the date wrong. And I actually often do get dates wrong because I'm dyscalculic. I can't do numbers. Um, but I hadn't. And the original plant is still there. And it's like a sort of green Christmas tree. So I do love foliage. I remember a book um, written by Ethne Clark 30 yes. years ago about winter gardens called Leaf, Bark and Berry. And yes, I, I thought, think what... I did have that at one time. Yeah. I thought, what an, what an apt title. But I think in the light of what's happening with you today, that we can add leaf, bark, berry, and flower. And flower, yes. Can't we? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, 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 I've I, got this very tatty iris flower, and you can see what's happened to it. It's been yes. chobbled. Sluggied. Actually, I, I, I love winter irises, but this isn't my favorite one. And the, the reason is that this Abingdon purple, um, it has very spindly stems, which tend to sort of flop over in the wind. It's not as sort of resilient as some, but if you pick most Iris unguicularis and you're like me and you have a rather boring life and you don't do very much, what you do is you pick, go out in, in the winter and you pick Iris unguicularis, Mary Bernard or Walter Butt. Mary Bernard is the lovely deep blue one. Walter Butt is the silver fox one. Alan. <laughs> yeah. uh, beautiful. I love it. And um, you can watch the buds unfurl as you have a cup of tea in your warm kitchen. That's my, one of my winter highlights. But this one doesn't do it. So I rather suspect it's, it's a hybrid. It's quite a good one. Uh, Val, I think you and I have something extremely um, pertinent in common and that we're, I'm afraid we're both silver foxes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, but yours is so much more elegant. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Can I talk a little about Walter Butt? Yes. Um, Walter Butt was the most amazing gardener and he was um, very into shrubs and trees. And it was said that he was Hillier's best customer. He, he bought so much stuff. And he, he had a very, very sloping garden. 
in Stroud. And if you've ever been to Stroud, you know, it is really steep, the valleys and the hills. Um, I bought an electric bike, which I got from Stroud, uh, because electric bikes are very popular in Stroud because nobody can get up the hills. So they had a fantastic <laughs> range of electric bikes. I went to buy my bike from this Stroud shop. And, and I, uh, I'm, I'm getting up quite a, a lot of hills, but nothing like um, some of the hills near Stroud. And he had this three or four acre garden and um, he had a stroke and he couldn't cope with it. And he was a man who wanted to do his own garden. He didn't want people to do the garden for him. So he moved down to Porlock, which is a great place for gardeners. And I think he took over Norman Haddon's garden. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I don't know which, I'm not absolutely sure about that, but he did move down to Porlock. And this garden stayed, dere, went almost back to dereliction um, in the, from about 1943 onwards, because um, it was the war and he didn't sell it. He just went down there and, and then finally um, it was sold um, to a family um, called the Matthiases. And they um, moved over from Norfolk and um, very flat in Norfolk as, um, Coward said, and um, poor old Gwen Ransom, who came over as the housekeeper, she threw a wobbler about two or three miles away from Stroud and refused to go down any more hills in the car and, and actually walked the last three miles. Anyway, this garden um, got covered by the snow in 1947, with the deep snow, and when it melted, it, it was full of snowdrops that were planted under the trees. And um, that is where um, S. Arnott was named and came from and the people who bought it then went on to um, start the giant snowdrop company which was the revival of snowdrops in the 19, late 1950s and 60s. So Walter Butt was quite, you know, quite a man. What a story. <laughs> no, cut it out, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I will not, I refuse. <laughs> But I, I like I like plants because they're all stories, you see. Yes. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Well, yeah. you know, I've, I've probably at this point now got new Flomo for a whole host of snowdrops <laughs> and for freckles, which I actually have had Flomo for for years. The amount of times we've talked about freckles on the radio. And actually, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm probably poised to make a clematis order at some point. So thank you. Um, <laughs> but when it comes to Flomo, anyone who's new to this podcast, if this is the first one you're listening to, well, boy, oh boy, you've got some others to go and listen to. One including Val. We've got Rosie and Rob Hardy. We've got just all Ben Preston, all kinds of amazing people to listen to. But if this is the first time you're coming across the term Flomo, it's probably not the first time you felt it that absolute fear of missing out about a plant that you've seen either growing in person in a magazine on instagram wherever it might be and aptly val my flomo this week comes from an article that i was at the sunday telegraph where you did some must-haves including yes, frilly so. knickers, that an enemy really knickers, yes. that captivated us so much on your last podcast um, and if people haven't seen frilly knickers the last podcast we got a really good look at it with rosie and rob hardy so you can go and see it on screen um with all of its amazing petalage but one of the things you wrote about is something i i have grown in the past when i gardened with my parents or gardened in my parents garden um, but I haven't had it since. And it's Miscanthus nepalensis, yes. which is a wonderful grass. And I particularly liked how you described it. I've written it down. In winter light, this Nepalese grass resembles an errant Afghan hound in a camel coat, all shake, shimmy and attitude. <laughs> I know, but they, they, took a, they took an important word out. Oh. It was a spiv's camel coat. <laughs> But they didn't like the word spiff in the Daily Telegraph. That happens to me all the time. <laughs> you, know, you go slightly over the top and... <laughs> the trouble is, you see, we've got two good memories because we do remember when camel coats were, were worn by spivs. They were, yes. <laughs> the only person who ever wore a camel coat in my childhood. Yeah. If you wore a camel coat and brown shoes... Oh, oh dear, dear. Brown, oh, my dear, brown shoes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought shake shimmy and attitude that really did sum up well any plant I want in my garden but um Miscanthus nepalensis it is a lovely grass obviously you think that too because you put it in your article I did but and because I'm cold people imagine I don't grow things but I'm south facing and um I have it in um um right in front of the house about 
probably about four or five feet away from the wall. There's a sort of terrace and then it's on just on the other side. And I, I, I'd seen it in a fair few gardens. And the one place that I really admired it was Bressingham, the Dell Garden at Bressingham, which well, was a beautiful in garden. Pardon? Wonderful in winter. Yes. And yes. I saw it and I was with Jamie Blake and I said, I absolutely love that grass. And I knew it wasn't, ten I knew it had a reputation of being tender, uh, but it was there in the winter and they go down really cold at Brassingham at times. Uh, so he had a spare plant and he gave it to me and I put it in. Um, and I did lose the original plant in a very hard winter. Um, but what I tend to do now is I try to put gravel around it. So it sells seeds as well yeah. uh, for me. And um, they messed up actually the other grass I really love, which was Steeper Barbata. I called it a Goldilocks of a grass and they changed it to Steeper Miscanthus Goldilocks. That wasn't the grass I meant at all. I meant <laughs> Steeper Barbata, which is that wonderful June and July flowering thing that has the great big feathery awns. Yeah. And um, I take the feathery awns off um, in, the, in the summer because they detach in about July and they have this sort of barbed bit um, that um, spirals into the soil as, as the grass gets wet and then dries again. It coils up like a spring and drills itself into the soil. But I like to put them in a vase and have them on the windowsill in winter. And then in the spring, I cut the tails off and I go and put them in coarse horticultural sand. And not all of them grow, but a proportion of them grow. And that gives me more plants for the following year. It's a really tricky grass to find in commerce, uh, Steve Abarbate. Oh I'm very lucky because our mutual friend, Brian Ellis, gave me seed of that this year in the summer. Yes. <laughs> It's absolutely I wonderful. In, I happened to be in his garden and we were seeing these twirly whirly things sort of flying yeah. around. I sort of earth's that. And he yeah. said, well, I'll take some seed for you, but gather them up and put them together and, you know, take it yeah. away. And... Yeah. Mm. I, I didn't get any seed off it this year, actually, uh -huh. uh, because it was it was so dry in, um, in the spring, it, mm. it never really got away. I had a few, but I just left them. To, I always leave a few to their own devices because it does yeah. sell seed for yeah. me. Um, not always where I want it, but <laughs> I've got a lot of seedlings at the moment in sand, which I'll pot up in about the end of January yeah. uh, and raise in there, and then I'll plant those out in about May. So I, I do like I do like grasses very much. Uh, so Val, what's your flomo? Well, my flomo is a rose that I saw um, probably about five years ago. Um, there's a garden near Burford called Astall Manor and the Mitfords lived there at one time. Oh, and okay. um, Rosie Pearson uh, took it over uh, about 20 years ago now, and she is very keen on roses and she got the Bannermans in to design the garden, the original garden. And um, it's one of the best gardens for roses that there is. It's open in the yellow book, not very often, but every other year they have a, an open sculpture exhibition uh, where lots of gardeners like me um, go around in June and rose time and completely ignore the sculptures and look at the roses. <laughs> and there was, a, we had, it was, we'd never got there because we're always too busy in the garden, but this particular Sunday was extremely wet, absolute sterods weather, in, and it was the last Sunday in June. And I said to the best beloved, come on, let's go and have a look at Astor. So we went there and we had it to ourselves almost surprisingly. Nobody else had ventured out, but there was, the best garland I've ever seen, the garland uh, round an arch, but there was also this rose on the wall that was called Lady Waterlow. And it was a sort of salmony ruffled flower, very wavy petals with a middle, and it was full of flowers. And it flowers once, and then you get a few more in the autumn. And it is just so pretty and so ruffled. So I thought, well, I will buy that rose. And of course I couldn't find it anywhere, so I couldn't buy it. But I've noticed just recently that it is being sold by Classic Roses, Peter Beals, David Austin, Trevor White Roses. So I've ordered three from Trevor White. So that is my Flomo. And I thought, well, who is this Lady Waterlow? And actually she was a Californian heiress who married uh, quite late in life. She was the second wife of a man called Sidney Waterlow, who'd been the Lord Mayor of London. And uh, it's a bit mysterious because the rose 
she actually married him in 1882 and became Lady Waterloo. But it says here on my notes that the, 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 the rose was named earlier than that and, and built by a chap called, uh, bred by a chap called Nabonormed in France. And it was named in 1863. So whether it was the first Lady Waterloo or the second Lady Waterloo is a mystery. But I've ordered three bare roots because I prefer to plant bare root roses and I'm going to put them in a rather horrible place um, near one of my stone walls. I've got these low stone walls and I, I plant on my side and then I let the roses go over the wall and flop over the wall and I've got the most wonderful lot of gardenia now which is an absolutely beautiful rose and then my neighbours have donkeys and then the donkeys come and prune them for me so it's um, but Lady Waterloo, I'm waiting for Lady Waterloo to arrive. She sounds fantastic. Salmon uh, and ruffle, no, that's my kind of rose. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I wrote down here, large and loosely formed, which I probably would say about myself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> which leads, leads us to Alan Gray's Flomo. What's yours this week? Well, my flomo is more of because um, it's more of a plant that I've, I'm, I'm already growing. And it's, it, I want to grow other varieties. And I, it, it's something that um, a lovely little sort of shade loving spring flowering plant called an epimedium or the bishop's hat. It's a plant that I've never actually, over my years in the garden, I think I'm just too impatient. It's a slow plant, really, I think. And it needs space and time around it. And I've actually got some um, epimediums that I probably planted two years ago that are now doing wonderfully well. And I've just got, as you know, thought as you've seen this new piece of woodland garden that we've, which, which was an old piece of woodland garden that's terribly shaded. And we've taken trees out now and we've let the light in. Um, loads and loads of homemade leaf mold has gone on, on in there, uh, gone on the soil in there. And so it's, it's an ideal position. And I want to get this wonderful sort of contrast of being from a, a hot, courtyard where you first come into a if you come into our house through the, by the by the front door it's a hot stony courtyard and you go through a door into this wonderful cool piece of woodland and i want that to sort of people i want people to think and look at it and think gosh i didn't know woodland could be so exciting yes and it can be and epimediums i mean are just such wonderful plants there's one or two things you have to know about them. the evergreen ones you have to give them a shave just before they're about to produce their flower buds otherwise the flowers are underneath the leaves um but they have lovely foliage never mind the flowers which are exquisite yes um, have lovely foliage and and they're very wiry stems and these mottled leaves and some are red underneath so they when they twist in the wind you get that lovely contrast um it's just something i need more of and as well as epimediums, I need some more varieties of erythroniums. I have pagoda, which is doing wonderfully well, but I'd like to have lots more. Um, yeah. You want something... Joanna, don't you? I want Joanna, yes, I do want Joanna. Well, I've got Joanna. I, yeah. I was lucky enough to get some from Keith Wiley at a sale. And um, I also, um, there's a garden down at Porlock again, that Joan Lorraine had, that has the national collection of erythroniums. And the one that she named after her mother, um, Winifred Lorraine, is an absolutely beautiful thing. Wonderful foliage, beautiful pink flowers. I probably got about 20 different ones in the garden. I do love erythroniums because we're quite cold here. And, um, you know, if we get a cold spring and it's damp, they do really well here. Yeah. I do yeah. love them. Yeah, um, I'm, going, I'm going a bit against the grain with me because we're, we, we are... Yes. We, we are very light soil um, and we are not moist. We're very dry. Yeah. Um, but hoping that I, with, with, with good cultivation, I can actually mitigate that. I think leaf litter is the answer. I yeah. don't make masses of leaf litter. Um, in fact, I don't make any. It's the best beloved who makes it. Yeah. It's the <laughs> but the, the leaf litter that we do make um, every other year, it goes on a bed where my trilliums and my yeah. uh, really nice uh, hepaticas and things are into the spring garden. And I'm so with you on woodland gardens yes. because um, I, it's my very favourite part of my garden. My garden faces south. It's on the top of the Cotswolds. It's so bright and stark. So to go down there, even though it's a much smaller area than you've got, and see all that wonderful cool greenery, yes. you know, and these little grasses and ferns and all the spring flowers, 
it's just absolutely beautiful. I think it's something that grows with you, you know, Val, because um, lots of the plants that probably grow in woodland that we love are probably not showy in the in the in terms of being flamboyant in any way. They have a certain subtleness about them, and I think it comes to you as you get older. Actually, you do appreciate that much more. Yes, I I also think that you know because um, most things sort of start on the ground. The early flowers start on the ground, and you've got the sort of dark brown earth. They they have almost like a jewel like quality. Those very yeah. early flowers. Yeah. And, um, I, I do I do love um, erythroniums. I I'm a bit naughty. I allow them to self seed. Um, I don't take the seed heads off. Well, that's um, no so bad. That, thing. I have got names in things like Margaret Matthew and yeah. Winifred um, Matthias and all the other ones that I've got. Uh, I'm hoping I get in time. I get a, a lot of seedlings. Um, that Actually, might be different. Carpets are very thrown. Yes. <laughs> what a lovely yes. idea. <laughs> well, with that, I think we probably better tuck a question into the end of this podcast and then bid each other adieu. Uh, the question is from Natalie, who stumbled across the first episode of this podcast. So she's got quite a lot ahead of her and she was loving it all. But she wanted to know what is the fertilizer that Herbert uses for his dahlias? He called it fairy dust. But what is it? Well, Herbert, what is it? <laughs> well, it, it, it is, it, it's fairy dust or fairy sprinkles. It looks like hundreds and thousands, the kind of cake decorations you buy and sprinkle on your cakes. Um, it's a, a fertilizer called Top Dress, and it's specifically designed for container grown plants to give them a boost. And I like to use this on not just dahlias, but also brugmansias and, and any of the plants that, that I'm going to be using in uh, containers for the summer. When we start them into growth, we what we do is we keep them nice and sort of dry throughout the winter. And then we gradually increase the temperature um, and the amount of moisture that we give them in February. And we um, at that time, I give them a dose of top dress. Now, top dress, I've explained what it looks like, but it's kind of clingy. It sticks to it sticks to the surface of the soil, but it sticks to your fingers and your gloves if you're wearing gloves as well. So beware of that. But it is a fertilizer designed just to kickstart plants into growth, and it does work wonderfully well. So when you get a Brugmansia, for instance, it looks slightly yellow and um, due to lack of temperature and everything else and being cold throughout the winter. When the temperature goes up, shall we say, to about 10 degrees, it suddenly basks and, and with top dress, it opens up and smiles and just looks so beautiful and prosperous and willing to give you wonderful flowers throughout the summer. Oh, wonderful. Fairy dust indeed. <laughs> Well, thank you. If you do want to ask a question, you can do what Natalie did and comment on one of our videos, any podcast, or you can email hello at getgardeningnow.co.uk. You can even attach a photo and we'll try to answer uh, your question on a future podcast. But for the time being, I love that my dog's jumped onto my lap and she can clearly see, I think she can see the postman out of the window. <laughs> <laughs> she suddenly looks interested. I don't think it's us. <laughs> So I can barely fit into the screen now, but I'll peer around her head and, uh, and wish you all uh, a wonderful gardening week. Thank you, Val, for joining us again. It has been so interesting. Oh, thank you very much for asking me. It's lovely to be able to actually talk to someone. <laughs> Lockdown times. Yeah. Well, powers of technology. <laughs> I'm just going to go off and look for Lady Waterloo. <laughs> yes. She's loosely formed. Well, I Yes, I mean, it, um, I recommend um, Trevor White. I think it was a better price, and I am Yorkshire. Uh, I know, I did think that when you said genetics. You, gave, you gave the three sources of supply, and when you said I've ordered it from Trevor White, I thought, yeah, and I know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody said they're very good. I've never ordered anything for them from them bare root before, but somebody recommended them. Well, Val, we'll catch up with you soon. If we don't speak to you, have a wonderful Christmas. Thank you very much, and the same Happy to you Christmas. both. Happy Thank gardening! Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> we don't know, we just started singing, I don't know why. After my last appearance, I thought when you weren't talking to me, I could <laughs> munch and eat, and then I realised when I watched it back, that actually I was munching and eating all the way through, so my apologies. <laughs> I thought this time I must try and posh up a bit. I don't know what this is.
bits and pieces of stuff that my dogs have been playing with. <laughs> what have they pulled it off? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>